We are in New York City, and we are gonna be talking to the founder and CEO of Canela Media, Isabel Rafferty Zavala. They are the fastest growing Hispanic media company in the US, and their crowning jewel is the app, Canela TV. Let's go talk to Isabel. All right, we are with the founder and CEO of Canela Media, Isabel Rafferty. Isabel, thanks for joining us. Thank you for coming. Thank you. Well, my first question is, is for those who don't know, Tell us what Canela Media is. Canela is comprised of a lot of different products. So our jewel product, what makes us the most proud is our streaming platform called Canela TV. So it was the first free streaming service for Hispanics in the US. Now Canela TV is not only in the US, but also in Latin America. We also have studios where we produce a lot of original programming daily from newscasts, entertainment shows, sports shows, we also manage a relationship with some of the largest media companies where we represent them in different territories. So for example, in the US, we represent Warner Brothers exclusively for Conexión Latina. We represent Marca, which is the largest sports site. In Latin America, we have Pluto TV, which is a very large uh, streaming platform that we represent them in most of the countries in Latin. So Canela Media is a little bit of any way uh, a brand can connect with Hispanics. We're, we're there to help them to be able to do it authentically. So are these the, the prominent shows, the originals? Yeah, some of the shows that we're most proud of. Okay, reality, docu-series. Correct, another reality. reality for, for and then, uh, our entertainment show that, that runs Monday to Friday. What's this Canela. one? This is a very interesting, we've done three series at this point. It's called Rising Notes. It's part of our music vertical. And we find up and coming artists and we highlight them and we create this docu-series on them. So Rising Notes, we had a client that time, it was McDonald's. And they said, we wanna find a way to authentically support Latinos. And I was talking to my head of music, it's like, how can we support Latinos? How we can create something that is unique and a good platform for them? It's like, well, there's amazing artists that don't have exposure. If we gave them exposure, maybe their career can grow faster. So that's how Rising Notes came through that idea and, and it has done that. It has helped a lot of artists get that exposure to accelerate their career, so. How did you get this idea to start the company? How did you start the company? Can you walk us through the origin story a little bit so we can learn about where it started and how it's evolved? Before launching Canela, I've been always focused in the media space, particularly in Hispanic. But then I started to move into the tech space. And my first job was with this startup that was just launching when mobile was a big thing. And I love the process of hiring open markets, developing product. So then I was like, I need to launch my own companies. I love this. I'm good at it. I want to focus in doing my own business. So after that, I launched another company called Mobius. It became very successful in the first year and it got acquired. And then I started to see a trend in the marketplace that there was these all the streaming companies coming to market. And that's when it hit me. I was like, hold on a second. There might be a lot of streaming companies, but I'm a Latina and I haven't seen a streaming service for Hispanics. I had been working with all the advertisers for many years. I had relationships with all the top Fortune 500s. And they always asked me, Isabel, do you have long form video so we can reach Hispanics that way through digital? And the answer was, no, that does not exist. The only thing you can find is YouTube video, short form video, but there's nothing out there. So I knew that demand in the advertising world existed. And then I knew our audience was gonna be hungry because Netflix was not reaching all Latinos in the US. There was not all the content that resonated with them. And Univision and Telemundo were, you had to be on, on cable. So I knew the opportunity was huge. And that's why we bet it all for Canela. So you're getting into a space where there's lots of money there's lots of big players involved. What was it like starting that company and then raising money for it? Uh, what challenges did you encounter during that process? Need is all about scale. So it's a hard place to compete. Not a lot of people are launching companies, but we knew that there was a possibility. We knew our audience was underserved, but we knew we needed capital. I was not aware how the process of raising capital worked at that point. All my previous jobs, I received money from investors, so it was a company within a large a group. So it was something that I was not aware how to do it. So I went online and researched how, how do you raise capital? 
And it sounded so easy. <laughs> and I read stories, and I'm a very positive Raising person. Raising $30 million, super easy. You see, I'm like, everybody does it. And I read the positive stories, because that's how I didn't say a guy's like, I was having coffee with an investor. I didn't even have a PowerPoint, and I wrote it in a napkin, and I raised 100 million. I'm like, oh, wow. I've been running media companies for a while. So for me, it's going to be a piece of cake. At the end of the process, I spoke to 180 VCs. After 180 no's, I got my yes. But it was a very difficult process. What I was not aware is that very few women raise capital. I think the percentage is under 2% of women are able to raise capital. I didn't know that. I'm glad I didn't know those stats because I went at it very strong. But I also knew that I could not give up. What changed is how I raised capital. The more I started reaching out to people, I realized that there were VCs focused in helping women raise capital and VCs focused in Latinos. So I, I say I found my angels, one of my early investors, Angeles Investors. Shout out, by the way, Angeles Investors. <laughs> Angeles Investors. Shout were... out to David and Adela, the best, and, and others. Yeah. <laughs> Adela was my angel. So I saw a publication online of Adela that she was opening this fund focused to Latinos. And I'm like, if somebody gonna understand this business is her. I need to reach out to her. So I reach out to her and say, I'm gonna be the largest media company out there. You wanna invest. So she answered at the second, I met with them. They saw the opportunity. I was like, raising capital, like this is so easy. Latinos get it. So I'm like, I went back to Google, BC is focusing Latinos. And I got my list. And then after I changed the way it raised, I had an oversubscribe round. People were fighting to invest because I found people that could relate, see me as a they leader, see relate. The, yeah. So we raised our seed at that moment was 3 million. Three million that changed really where Canela is. And after that, we raised our Series A, so 32 million. And right now, we're raising a very large round. So now it's easier. So now you're starting to get into the arms race of media. You're starting to build up the gun so you can start to really start taking the market. Exactly. Yeah. To be able to be successful in this industry, which we've been very successful, we need to become the largest media company for Hispanic. And that's my goal. My goal is not to build a second off or third off, we're gonna be the number one in the Hispanic marketplace. So that requires a lot of capital. But the difference of our company is it has always, the business model has work. We're one of the few companies that has been profitable since very early on. So we're very efficient on how we invest our money and creating a foundation like that allows us to build a very large company now. What made you wanna become an entrepreneur? I did not wanna be an entrepreneur. I was, I grew up saying, I do not want to be an entrepreneur. I was very clear. My parents were entrepreneurs and I thought that was a very stressful life. Okay. I was about to ask <laughs> why. <laughs> yes. My mom and dad uh, had a very successful business and they were always stressed. So for me, it was very clear, whatever I do in my career, I'm not going to follow their footsteps because it leaves stress and I don't want to leave a life so stressful. So that was one thing I had clear. It's like, whatever I do, I'm not going to do that. It's amazing how... Boy, if I can look wrong? back, <laughs> so I went. I'm gonna find a, a nice job in a company where I can grow. There's not much uh, risk. Yeah, where I can less live a turbulence. comfortable life, less turbulence, and ensure I never hit that path. And now I cannot imagine doing anything else but growing companies. I love the thrill. Yes, it's very stressful. Yes, but it's also very exciting to get to see your ideas grow. To build teams to build your own vision your own vision and it's an incredible journey it is a very painful journey i think it's not for everyone because it is very stressful i want to know a little bit more about you mentioned your parents mm -hmm. um and then ultimately you said you didn't want to be an entrepreneur but nope. can you describe your uh you know some formidable experiences when you were younger how you grew up like clearly something at some point made you want to be who you are today so tell me about your growing up life, like where you grew up and how you ultimately got to this spot. I'm in New York and now you're raising tens of millions of dollars and running a media company that's competing with major media players. I mean, it's quite a journey. It's quite when a you, journey. When you pull back and examine it. And, and, and I mean, I'm so similar to my mother. I, I like, now I look back, I'm like, why did I not want it to be like her? I'm like, so similar how we are. So growing up, I grew up in Mexico City and my mom and dad worked together. My mom was a very creative mind. 
and she grew this a company very, very fast in, in Mexico that exported uh, handcrafts into the US. So I think my mom was the only mother of my classmates at work. So what I could see as a child was we had plays and we had different activities and all those moms were very available to, to work, to be in the school and help in the school. And my mom was always running. Like she was working all day and then picking, we were the last ones to be picked up at school. And I'm like, mom, why can't you I have to be the last one? But she, she was a fantastic mother. Although she, she was very, very busy on business. She always had time for us. But it was, I was just comparing it to the other mothers. And I felt like, look, the other mothers get to have coffee and go to the school, do their nails. And my mom is always stressful, flying all over the United States. Mm -hmm. Like she travels a lot. That sounds like a horrible life. That's what I thought. My mom has a horrible life because she's always stressed and, and has all these responsibilities. And then my mother would say, I love my life. I love working. I love business. Interesting. This drives me. And I would say, my to myself as a child, I'm like she's just saying that to make herself feel better. Mm -hmm. But as I grew and I realized, I love working too. I enjoy the thrill. I love being busy. I'm just like my mother. I, I'm adventurous. She moved from the whole family from Mexico to the U.S. to grow even faster her company. I move all my family from California into New York. So the more I grow, the more I'm like her, and she's a great role model for me. I don't know why I did not. I, I didn't see that as a child. For many, many years, when I was in college, I said, okay, I'm doing college, I'm gonna finish college, my degree, but then I don't wanna work. I wanna be a stay-at-home mom, because motherhood was very important to me. But then I, I was not married at that point, I finished college, and I'm like, what do I do now? So I kind of went into business because I'm like, I have to do something after college. And then when I got into business, I loved it. Mm -hmm. I, was, I realized what my mom felt the thrill of making negotiations, growing something, and I was hooked and I, I love I love working. So that change you have a plan and yeah, it changes. What percentage of the Hispanic speaking market mm -hmm. that has not been tapped into? Say what where you're at now and where could you go? Like we have 15% of the uh, the Spanish speaking market. Like where, where are you right now? Yeah, we're around 30% penetration okay. uh, for the Spanish speaking Latino in the US. Our goal is to, in a few years, we should be around 50%, which is a pretty healthy number. You have a uh, Canela kids too. Yes. yes. So you have these, all these different segments. You're trying to truly become the largest media company in the Hispanic market. And it's interesting when, you, when I say your personal life as a founder gets very close with your business life. When I launched Canela Kids, I was pregnant with my daughter. As a mother, one of the biggest concerns I have is that my daughter is bilingual. So that was such top of mind that I'm like, how can I ensure that my daughter is gonna be bilingual? I'm like, I have to launch a kids platform that is all in Spanish. So when she watches content, I, she has a place to go and she can learn more Spanish. So that's how Canela Kids was born. In, it was because of her. And then this series, I guess it's also for, because of her, it's called Super Ellas. And what we're doing is we want young girl Latinas to identify with amazing trailblazers because they see a lot of stories of famous people, but maybe they don't see themselves represented in those stories. So we wanted to highlight incredible Latina women that have done amazing things for us. And we're already in season two of this. It's been very, very successful. And for example, Frida Kahlo. We look at Frida Kahlo since she was a little girl so girls can identify with her and how she grew to be this amazing, amazing artist. So Super Aegis is one of them, won a lot of awards, but you all came because of, as a mom, besides being a CEO, as a mom, this is something that I knew was needed. Where was your audience emerging at first and what does the audience look like now? I'm seeing the YouTube subscribers, which I know is different than your platform, yeah. but can you tell me a little bit about the audience? What initially drew advertisers to your platform? Because obviously you need a good audience for advertisers. So yeah. tell me a little bit about it and how it started to expand. So I, it reminds me of the very early days when we launched in May the platform. I will wake up every morning and there was a report that would tell me how much users we have. And it was very clear since early on that we had a hit. Because every day that I woke up, the report would come out at 3 a.m. And I kept saying 1 million, 2 million, 3 million. And it was so exponential, the growth, that I was like, this is, this is it's what we, it's, yeah, happening. it's happening. It's real and there's a need for the product. So 
We're today a closer platforms around 50 million monthly active users. Wow. So we Good reached a you. lot of people, not only in the US, we're in Mexico, Colombia, we recently expanded into Peru, and we're in the, op in the process of open all Latin America. So the users have grown exponentially. And that's very key for a media company because advertisers are looking half for quantity of users, but a very particular niche audience that we offer. Well, it's not niche in the US if you think about it. Latinos, we're sometimes majorities in certain states, but we reach Hispanics in the US at a bigger scale than most platforms out there. So we're able to provide our advertisers a one-stop solution for them. What difficulties did you encounter while raising with that first set of 180? Did you get any people that were shrugging you off or kind of uh, they wanted to get out of the meeting as soon as they took it. Like, did you get any moment? Because you mentioned you, you experienced some difficulty with, with your accent. Like, did people uh, just not give you the time of day and that kind of gave you a little fire in and There's of yourself? There's a few things that, for example, our email signature has our picture and our name. And I was sending those emails out to get meetings with venture groups. And my return was very, very few people will respond. But then I have a colleague who is a white guy, tall guy, he will send the same email that I wrote and he will get so many meetings. So for me to get meetings, what we do, he will schedule the meetings and then he will be in the screen and they will look at him as, oh, you must be the boss, right? And he'll be like, no, this is my CEO. So I think people, they, they don't meant to, to not think about you as a leader. They invest in people that they see themselves on. So they don't see success in a female, in a Latina, but I had the background. I had the background. I have run two companies very successfully. We had a product already when we were racing, a very successful app that already had a lot of viewers. We had sales. There's a lot of people that race just with an idea. We had data validating our model and still was difficult. So today the investors that I had, my series seed, for example, was only basic group focused in females and in minorities. That was 100% of my race. So as the company has grown and evolved, it gives me the opportunity to be in the driver's seat and decide who is gonna invest in the company. Right. You can be more strategic with everything. So now, of course, I, I like to invite my old investors to, to join me in every round because they believe in this early on and they deserve that success as well. These awards on the right, they're pretty prestigious. Like you have Fast Company, Most Innovative Companies, the top 100 women of influence. How does one stay hungry when you've already had so much success? Because there's always more, I think. It depends on your personality. When you achieve something, you always realize there's more opportunities. So I think it's your, your goals always increase. So you say, I remember when I launched Canela, it's like I saw the evaluation of some of the media companies in the AWOT space. I'm like, if I could ever, a company be worth half of that, that'd be incredible. Now our company works more than that. And I'm like, no, 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 that's not enough. We can go public, we can be worth billions. So I think if you love what you do, you, uh, the ambition is always greater. And I don't know, I, I, I wish one day I could say I'm fulfilled and this is good enough, but not yet. Do you think you have an itch to keep going? I think I'm like a cockroach. And <laughs> I'm never gonna die. And I'm just gonna keep at it, keep at it, keep at it. Like, That's think the about first it. time I've heard someone say, I think I'm a cockroach. <laughs> After so many no's from VCs, most people say, no way, this is not, I'm not gonna build this business. I think I must be a cockroach. What are your hobbies outside of this business? Oh, this is a very hard question. Yeah. I do not have hobbies. It's horrible. My husband always says, how can you not have another hobby? I should have another hobby. I love working. So if I have free time, I work more. Okay. Uh, I, don't, I don't recommend it for everybody, but that's what thrives me and I love. And I'll say my children. So if I'm not working, I'm with my kids. And you have four children. I have four children. Okay. So that in itself, Keeps you very, very busy. Yes. So, but I work really hard and I, I try to be the best mother I can for my children. Nothing wrong with that. All right, what non canella Media TV show are you binging right now? Although you just said no hobbies, but you know, at night you gotta watch something, right? Like Actually, no. <laughs> okay. If I'm watching shows, I usually it's Canela shows. And I'm obsessed with Turkish novelas. Okay. They're like 400 episodes long. So once you're hooked, you're like, you don't have a life anymore. Yeah, so yeah. because they're so addictive. 
Where would you travel to with your family if you could just like that? Well, I just took my boys to Spain. Nice. So we just came back from there. One of the key things for me that is very important, I want my kids to be bilingual. So yes, Spain was our last trip. I love going to Mexico. I'm very proud of my roots. And I want my kids to experience why Mexico is so incredible. Our culture, our food, our family. So it's very important that although they're born here, I want them to be proud, say I'm Mexican too. Mm -hmm. So they need to understand well the culture for that. Speaking of food, what's your last meal on earth? My last meal, oh, enchiladas de mole. There we go. All right, well, Isabel, thank you so much. I appreciate it. Thank you for your time. And sincerely, I'm pumped <laughs> to see where this goes. Thank you. It's already gone so far, but I'm, I'm the so sky's the limit. The sky's so the we're limit. just I, getting started. I know. I'm really excited to see you get to the biggest media company for Hispanics. It's going to be exciting to see. Yeah, it's going to be fast. So you don't have to be that patient. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. So are these the... Oh, quick clap. That'll be bloopers. Don't worry, we met earlier. <laughs> that was a good clap. <laughs> So I guess it sounds like an echo. I'm gonna say non canela media show or movie are you into right now? I'm gonna say show because you can't be into a movie for more than the time that you watch the movie. So what non canela <laughs> They're Latinos, they're not meant to be quiet. <laughs> you know we're it's a fun company.